Thank you for joining us at Inclusion Fusion. My name is Katie Weatherby, and I'm very excited to introduce to you Rhonda Martin. Rhonda is a licensed professional clinical counselor, a board certified professional counselor, and a diplomat in pediatric anxiety disorders. Rhonda is also a board member for Key Ministry, so I'm lucky to be able to spend extra time with her now and then when we have board meetings. And we're very pleased and proud to announce that she's currently touring the United States and promoting her book called Stuck, which is about a, a, an adorable little girl named Cinnamon who has obsessive compulsive disorder. Rhonda, thank you so much for coming today. Katie, thank you for having me. It's wonderful to spend time with you. Well, I think that we should really have an overview of some anxiety disorders that could interfere with a child's experience with church and also with the child's own devotional time with God. How can you um, help us to understand those? Well, it's best if we talk about um, today in terms of the four different anxiety disorders that are the most prevalent in churches and my practice. The four that we'll discuss today in this order will be generalized anxiety disorder, and that's a lot of times just referred to as someone who has anxiety. You might recognize it just simply as that. Second would be social phobia, mm -hmm. which of course we can picture how that might be extremely mm -hmm. difficult in mm -hmm. a church setting for a child. Mm -hmm. And third, we'll talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. And then fourth, OCD. Okay, so with those um, categories in mind, let's start with generalized anxiety disorder. And tell us a little bit about how that child might look at church. Well, typically, if you have a child who's anxious, you're going to sense that you're maybe not able to connect with that child the same mm -hmm. way you can with the other kids that come in. Mm -hmm. If the kids are just taking their coats off and taking a seat and checking in, it might be the child that's kind of looking down at the floor and they don't have that confident eye contact with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It might be a child who, you know, when they come in, they just kind of try to find a place away from everyone else and mm -hmm. just try to keep to themselves a little bit. And so you're going to be looking for some shyness traits at mm -hmm. the beginning. And when they sit down and you start to do your lesson, they might be biting their fingernails. Mm -hmm. Some of the girls and even some of the boys will twist their hair. They might okay. play with their hair and look kind of insecure about that. So just really anything that you view as an insecurity would be the first sign that you would see as a teacher with a child that has generalized anxiety disorder. Okay, so... When this kind of child is getting ready for church, what would that look like? Well, they would be nervous that they would be mm -hmm. on time. This child would be concerned. They don't want to draw extra attention to themselves. They don't want to inconvenience anyone else. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be kind of pushing the family ahead to get there on time. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. might have a lot of questions in the morning for their parents. You know, what What if my teacher's not there today? Mm -hmm. Or what if my best friend Emily's not there? They might be a little bit concerned about those kinds of things. And really, mm -hmm. they just want everything to go well. They might ask you for an order of what time are we leaving? What time am I going to get there? And they're just going to have a little bit of an upset stomach, too, mm -hmm. sometimes. Mom and dad may try to give them breakfast. And really, short of um, just maybe a few crackers, they may not want to eat mm -hmm. because that child doesn't really feel good. It can make them have a sick stomach in the morning. Okay. So with that in mind, then, what kind of a devotional life or a prayer life will that child have and what what might that look like because I would imagine that the anxiety spills over even into that aspect of the child's life. Well it does and in a way though it it might be a strength for the child with mm -hmm. generalized anxiety disorder when it comes to their devotional life because they're very conscientious. This is a child who wants to please the Lord. Mm -hmm. This is a child who's very obedient. Mm -hmm. If they've been instructed in their Sunday school class that they should spend time with God every day in their prayer life and their devotions this child's doing it seven days a week because mm -hmm. they're very conscientious. And oftentimes the patients that I work with that have generalized anxiety disorder, they can even cite for you a time of day that they do their devotions. Mm -hmm. It might be at 7.15 in the morning before school or it might be at bedtime. But this is definitely a conscientious child who's going to be with the Lord when they commit to it. So that, I would say, would be a strength for an anxious child. Okay, well, and, and that's important to mention, too, that... Um, we always want to be looking for the strengths in any child that has a hidden disability. Um, I would imagine, though, a child who has generalized anxiety disorder might be difficult to comfort at times. And I wonder what Sunday school teachers and volunteers and pastors should know about comforting a child like this. It's a great question. 
Well, some of the ways that a child that has anxiety can be comforted, um, it's going to be a little bit based on their age, but let's start out with um, just maybe a first or second grader. Okay. One of the most important factors for an anxious child is that they feel someone is in command and control of the classroom. They like a lot of order. They like the teacher to be warm to them, to definitely connect with them. I like to see the teachers really focus on their nonverbals if they have an anxious child Mm -hmm. in the classroom. I like to see them have good eye contact. Mm -hmm. Call the child by their first name often because, you know, that's music to a child's ears Mm -hmm. to hear their own name. You know, Emily, what do you think the answer to this question is? And let them hear their name. Let them have that connection. Mm -hmm. A lot of open nonverbals, too, just open wrists are very comforting Mm -hmm. when you're talking to someone that's a little bit anxious. So I would think that if they can just kind of watch those nonverbals and provide extra comfort with that child, and maybe even pair them up with a buddy. Someone that's not real loud, like, you mm-hmm. know, some kids are really like to be outgoing and have fun. Not That's not going to be the child we're going to pair with this anxious child. We're going to pick one of the more quiet ones, but yet one who is assertive, that if they notice that little Emily is having a problem, that this child's going to go to the teacher and let her know. Okay, so with all of that in mind, what could a volunteer or a pastor anticipate that could go wrong for a child with generalized anxiety disorder at church? Well, anything that the child with anxiety would perceive to be wrong mm-hmm. would be anything that does not go according to the planned schedule. Okay. So if there's a chart up on the wall that explains what happens at each time, let's say, for example, there's a fire drill or a tornado drill or a stranger danger drill, mm-hmm. that child is going to have a more difficult time because obviously that's mm-hmm. not written into the schedule. So if you know that's going to happen, you always want to tell the parent and the child of an anxious, you know, anxious child that that might happen that morning so they can prepare for it. But in if it, you know, if it's not something that they know about ahead of time, keep them right with you when there's something that deviates from what you expect on the schedule. Mm-hmm. Another situation that may make a child uncomfortable who has anxiety is if there are large groups of kids that seem to be leaving them out mm-hmm. or, you know, not including them, or maybe they happen to know each other a lot better. And one thing that we find really helps is make a group for them. Mm-hmm. Come up with two or three individuals that you can just plan ahead and make mm-hmm. a group for that child so that they can be comfortable. If there's a situation where maybe two kids are having a disagreement about something, that's certainly not on the schedule for the day it's going to upset that child also. So again, it's getting command of the classroom very quickly and having the confident teacher look at all times and then just reassuring that child. So classroom management is not only important for learning, but also just for social comfort, especially for a child with this profile. Absolutely. So let's move on to social phobia then. What does that look like at church? Well, social phobia is really, really difficult because First of all, we don't get the kids that have social phobia every week to teach. They tend to be the ones that have to kind of make themselves feel like coming to church. They're the ones that last minute are just going to be crying at home, not wanting to come because they're so uncomfortable with it. So the first thing you might notice is it's a child that comes maybe every three or four weeks. They have okay. inconsistent attendance. It's also going to be a child who, when they come in, they're just going to want to not be seen. Mm. They want to, they just want to blend in, fit in. They don't want anyone to notice anything. And this child is one that just kind of wants to dress exactly like everyone else, just to fit in. No extra attention. They won't be around the children that might be outgoing or a little bit loud because they won't want to be next to someone who's being looked at. Okay. They just want their own little private place to be quiet. Okay, interesting. So what would that look like in the morning before the child even gets to church? Well, then? it would be. It would look like, let's say there's two siblings and mom and dad. It would look like mom is ready, dad is ready, brother's ready, sister's ready. And this little child that has mm. social phobia is still is sitting there in her pajamas, hasn't touched any food, is upset, nervous, won't leave the front of the TV set, and is really having quite a meltdown just emotionally, does not want to move ahead and get ready and go on mm. to that next step. Okay. All right. Um, so with a child like this, how would the social phobia then affect devotional time and a prayer life and a relationship with the Lord? Well, along the similar lines of the generalized anxiety, 
these two disorders are very similar in the sense that they are a strength with God. Mm -hmm. The child that has social phobia, God is their maker. God knows how they're made. There's not an ounce of anxiety or phobia in dealing with God. They can read the Bible and have total peace and comfort. They can pray to God, and there's not one single ounce of anxiety. So social phobia is an impact in a relationship with God other than church attendance. All right. So when the child is able to come to Sunday school or church, um, even if it's inconsistently, we want volunteers and pastors to also know how to comfort that child. And that might look a little different than a child with generalized anxiety disorder. Right, exactly, and and would require a little bit different accommodating for mm-hmm. that child. If you know ahead of time that the child has that, you'll want to make sure if there's a little table where there's going to be a Bible lesson, you'll want to be sure that you direct the child in, you know, meet them, call them by name, use the open nonverbals, the same with the anxiety, and say, Susie, come on in, I have a seat for you. And if you get over to that table and you notice that the only chair is beside the speaker, don't put that child there. Okay. They don't want to be anywhere in the spotlight. You might want to say to your other student, Benjamin, could you just switch seats so that uh, we can have an open seat right there for our guest Susie or okay. to sit there? Good. So we're going to bring her back, take her away from the spotlight, put her beside quiet children who aren't going to be raising their hand a lot, and we're just going to keep her a little comfortable place in the back. And, you know, just try your best to make sure that if something would go wrong, uh, maybe if she would spill something on herself or get marker on her, just help her clean it up and, and move past it and make sure that there's very little attention directed to her. So this is not the kind of child that when she crosses the threshold of the room, we say, Susie, it's so great to see you here. Right. So we really need to make sure that our greeting matches the child's needs. Absolutely. All right, all right. So what might present a problem for a child with social phobia at church? Well, if if something embarrassing would happen to them, Mm -hmm. um, let's use the example of if if a teacher would be having all the children take their turn reading a verse in Matthew Mm -hmm. Matthew 6. When we are going around the table, we don't want to have patterns mm-hmm. of, you know, and then skip over that person, then everyone knows we skipped over right. them. If we're doing reading where everyone's participating, it would be best for the teacher to just call out the names, but be sure not to include that child as an out mm-hmm. loud reader, and even let the child know ahead of time, hey, I'll just call on the kids when it's time to read, but, you know, unless you kind of give me a wink and let me know you want your turn, I'm just going to call on the other ones, mm-hmm. and, and that's how we'll do it's that. sort of like a secret signal. Exactly. Your secret signal is very valuable. So just, you know, really, unless that child has something happen that calls them out in the front, then they're going to be just fine. Okay. So if that does occur or anything embarrassing happens, if they're walking across the room and they slip and fall, you know, maybe it's icy or, you know, it's been snow and they have their boots on, they slide because the floor is wet. Just do your best to just, oh, you know what, let me just help you up right here. We'll just dry those off. Come on over with me and look what we have coming up next and just get moving right past okay. it. Okay. All right, that's that's good to know, um, because we don't want kids to be uncomfortable as soon as they hit the door. No. So with all of that in mind, let's move on to post-traumatic stress disorder. I think some of our viewers might be a little surprised that that can occur in children. So can you talk a little bit more about what that looks like in a church setting and and how kids might even come to have post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, Katie, generally with post-traumatic stress disorder, it's either one really significant, awful thing that a child has gone through or witnessed, or it can be something that's pretty bad, but it has happened over and over. Mm -hmm. And how do we know? We typically don't know when we first see someone that has PTSD, especially a child. We typically don't know. And there have been a lot of children that I've worked with in the past that are very, very, you know, faithful Christians, and they have talked and we've had special sessions just about how do I handle certain things at church because even though you may not be able to look at them and tell that they have PTSD, church can be a very difficult place for them. Okay, all right. Um, When we think about 
a child who has PTSD, are there things in the Bible, for example, or things that they might be hearing in their classes that would trigger anxiety for a child like that? Yes, there is. And many of the incidents that have been stressful and caused the PTSD for children involve mm-hmm. violence. Okay. As a result of that, Many of my patients will report that there is a very difficult time if there's a prayer request and a student's worried about bullying that's Mm -hmm. happening at school because that child feels that for them Mm -hmm. at a level beyond just empathy. It's one where their body has a heightened awareness and they're very vigilant when they hear that. There can be times around Easter when we go through the Good Friday story Mm -hmm. and we hear about Jesus and his crown of thorns and what happened and, and him carrying his cross. Even though we know that we honor our Lord by hearing that story and remembering it at Easter time and many times throughout the year, it has a different response to those children that have post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. It really causes them to be under duress. They can get higher heart rates, higher blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Their bodies tense up. They sweat. They're stressed out. They don't know the difference in their body. Their mind does, but their body doesn't know the difference between that story being real or something happening to them like it did in the past. Some people might be concerned then that we're not teaching truth to a child because we're, we're omitting that part of the story. And I think it's important to address that because volunteers and pastors feel very responsible for teaching the Bible as it's written. So how do we reconcile those two goals, keeping a child feeling safe and secure and also teaching truth? Well, that's a great question. And you always want to go with the agenda that is the plan for what is being taught. Always. Mm -hmm. We never, ever want to not speak the truth of God ever. So you speak that. What we do is accommodate the child. Mm -hmm. Whereas in social phobia and generalized anxiety disorder, you're kind of, you're keeping the child in the room all the time and you're kind of just, you know, helping them. And it's actually very good. Everyone gets the Mm -hmm. whole word of God and teaches other people some things about how they might help others. Buddies are getting to help. With PTSD, we don't always keep the child in the room. Mm -hmm. And with PTSD, we accommodate and modify for that child. Mm -hmm. So if I know, and I've been told by the mother or father or grandparent that the child has PTSD, and I know what the topic is that day, Mm -hmm. I might decide that, you know what, there's another classroom that's just a grade younger than us. Why don't we see if we can have you be an assistant in there for this morning? And we'll just remove that child. Because even though we know that child needs the truth too, Mm -hmm. that child knows the truth, but that child is not emotionally able to discuss it that time. Mm -hmm. So we go ahead with that Mm -hmm. accommodation. Another accommodation is in some of the youngest patients who have PTSD, if the color, if they're coloring for the day and maybe it's some, uh, an Old Testament uh, fight that occurred Mm -hmm. and all the other kids are happy with their crayons and they're just coloring and they're all happy, a child with PTSD may not like to do that because it it really stresses their body out. Okay. So in that case, knowing that that child has that, we might just want to go back through a previous week or even a future week's coloring picture and just slide it into that child and say, you know what, I want you to do this one this Mm -hmm. week. So -hmm. we're never going to withhold the word of God ever from the classroom, but we are going to just provide reasonable accommodations for that child. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, So before a child with PTSD comes to church, what is the getting ready process looking like for that child? Well, typically it's normal. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you're not going to notice anything. Mm -hmm. And the way that PTSD manifests with people close to you is anger. A person who's having an episode of PTSD typically will be very angry. If it's people they really know well. If it's in a church setting, it might be a little bit of fear Mm -hmm. and it might be just quiet and you won't know. Individuals that have PTSD are typically very, very polished at making sure that that stuff doesn't really manifest outwardly around people they don't know real well. Okay. All right. Um, So what about an individual's prayer life and and devotional time and relationship with God? How does PTSD enter into all of that? Well, it follows along whatever, if the PTSD, it waxes and wanes, it goes back and forth. Some individuals, when they have had a recent trigger, something that reminded them of that event, they might be two or three days out, Mm -hmm. just totally stressed out. And then that heightened, vigilant, alert state during those times, 
they're not going to be having real good devotions. Um, at best, they might sit down and try to read the Bible, but they're not really going to absorb it too well at that point. Okay. During the times which we always hope for that most of the time, it's in the waning stage where it's really not a factor in their life. They're fine, and they're just like anyone else with their devotions and okay. their you know study and their relationship with God. Okay. All right. Um, how do we comfort the child with post-traumatic stress disorder when that child is at church and and really frightened? Um, and, and I know from what I've learned from you that the, the fear is related to a past event. Mm -hmm. So what do we do as volunteers and pastors to help that child? Some of the ways that they, the child with PTSD can be helped are just helping them realize that they, they can escape. Part of PTSD is being trapped. It's a feeling of being mm. trapped. So in some of the mega churches, in the larger mm. ones, even without PTSD, you might wonder, how am I going to get out of here if you're a little eight-year-old kid? Right. Like, how am I going to find my way out this big place if I have to? So one thing that helps with children that have PTSD to make sure they don't get a trapped feeling is to show them the map by the door that's the fire escape map and say, look, I just want to share with you something today. I want you to see where our room's at in relation to the rest of the church. Let's look at this. Oh, do you remember coming mm -hmm. down this hall? And is this the set of doors you came in? And just, and if, and if you have an assistant or two and you have the right ratio and you can leave the room for a minute, it's worth a walk down there just to walk to the exit and mm -hmm. show them where it's at. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you might want to do is make sure that they don't feel trapped and that they have a grand exit plan. The second one is making sure they have a tentative escape plan okay. so that if they ever feel uncomfortable, there's another classroom maybe of the grades right below them that we, that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Or they might um, just show them where the restroom is. If they need to, to select a restroom a little further away, a second place they can go. Um, maybe there's a little um, lobby that always has a receptionist and you know that it's close by. Make sure mom and dad always know mm -hmm. that you have these plans in place. The grand escape plan, the little tentative one in case they need it and even a lobby place because mom and dad always need to approve of the fact that the child can leave the room and come back if they have a situation with PTSD. Okay. And again, it's age dependent. Is it wise to let the child with PTSD know where the mom and dad are going to be? Always. Okay. Yes. And they can see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And usually with PTSD, the parents are going to know that there's a diagnosis, not, mm -hmm. or at least maybe if they don't have it narrowed down to that exact anxiety diagnosis, they're going to know something's going something's on. So going they're going to be able to kind of help you or tell you what might have worked in the past for them, and you can draft a plan up together. How do kids with PTSD respond to choices? For example, you were talking about the coloring activity, mm -hmm. maybe setting off a child or making a child nervous. Is it wise to say, we, you can either work on this project or we can make cards for some of our members who are in the hospital right now? That is such a great question. Uh, the, to give them a choice or not to. In mm -hmm. that case, not to. Not to. The reason for that is because a child who has any trigger of post-traumatic stress disorder, they're very similar mm -hmm. to you or I if we were in a burning building and we were in emergency mode. At that time, we don't respond well to choices. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. want directives. We want direct orders. You know, go down this hall, go down those steps. Mm -hmm. This child wants put this piece of paper aside and color this pretty card for it. And one of the elders in our church. You have to give them that. Whenever an individual has heightened, oh, that heightened alert feeling and that vigilance, they lose 25 to 30 percent of their verbal ability. So they are not able to process the jumble of words that mm -hmm. they are going to hear or that they might have to respond to. Mm -hmm. So they may get even more frustrated. And they're really not in any shape to be making no, choices. No, if, if you sense that there's been a trigger because maybe the paper's been slid in and it just dawned on you, oh, I forgot there's you know that situation, mm -hmm. you'll want to do the directive. You'll want mm -hmm. to clearly let them know, this is your project here are the color of crayons. I need this card done for this elder who's in the hospital. I'm going to remove this. This is going on my desk. Let me know when you're all done with the card. Okay. Sometimes for some kids, providing an emotional label to what's going on is helpful. In this case, it doesn't seem like you're recommending that. It doesn't seem like you're saying, 
you're looking nervous to me, and so we're going to do something else. Right. It's kind of like, to go back to that fire scenario, mm -hmm. it's it really and truly, their body is hypervigilant as mm -hmm. though it were an emergency. And if, if I were in a building and there was a fire, you know, if someone was telling me, gosh, you look like you're terrified, you're afraid, it would just, I wouldn't even hear the words. I would be worrying about where the stairs and the door were. Okay. So they're not able to process that. That's in that 25 to 30 percent that, that's just not going to be able to be handled at that point. Right. I think that's such a good explanation for folks who are volunteers because this is really far beyond a nervous tummy of coming to a new church for the first time. This is really a panicked, panicked child. Right. Okay. So what else could be a problem for a child with PTSD at church? Well, just typically uh, anything that would trigger them. I mean, you know, if you look at the anything to do with the violence, anything to do with two children not getting along, they might, you know, most of the kids might just keep playing and not even notice it. But for mm -hmm. that child, if the trauma that caused their PTSD has something to do with violence or people not getting along, that is going to be overwhelming for them. So just being aware of how that child might feel. And it, okay. they won't hide it. When they're scared, they're going to jump, they're going to look, and it's going to, they're going to be very obvious about it. Okay. Let's talk about obsessive compulsive disorder now. And I think that this is... Um, this is a, a topic that you're really invested in right now, especially because of Cinnamon mm -hmm. and your book about obsessive compulsive disorder in kids. Um, I, I understand that um, the, the way that OCD manifests in kids is very often that it attacks, the, the obsession attacks what the child loves the most. Explain that a little bit to us and, and help us understand exactly what that means so that volunteers and pastors can understand that. Sure. What that means is that OCD will typically be about the most feared part of OCD because everyone who has OCD has one thing that they fear the most. Clearly, mm -hmm. there's a hierarchy and there's one thing at the top. And OCD is going to go by whatever the child loves the most is the most emotionally attached to. So what we'll see in children who have been raised in Christian homes or in, Christ in Christian churches and that have received Jesus as their Savior, mm -hmm. they are going to love the Lord and they're going to think that if I step on that black crack or that black square on the floor, will that mean that, that Jesus is going out of my heart? Will mm -hmm. that mean this? You know, they're going to worry the most about that which they love the most, which for a small child is going to be the Lord, their mom their dad and their siblings. So it does, in fact, there's even a branch of OCD called scrupulosity. Mm -hmm. And that's just simply the OCD issues revolving around your spiritual beliefs. Okay, that's really important for volunteers and pastors to understand. Given that we understand a little bit now about scrupulosity and how obsessive compulsive disorder might affect a child's faith, what is that going to look like at church? Well, at church, it's going to be a situation where all the processes of coming into the classroom, sitting down, doing the work, playing with other children, they're all going to be impacted. And generally, the way it would look with a child with moderate to severe OCD is that they would enter into the classroom they might be distracted by walking through the door. In some cases, they feel like they had to have a good thought while they walk through mm -hmm. the frame of the door. If they didn't, they might tell you they have to walk back out the door to get something in the hallway and walk back in again. And if, if for some reason it happens to be a good thought that time, then they can keep walking. Mm -hmm. They might come over to their chair and the table and take pull the chair out and take a look at it and see, are there any spots on that chair? Mm -hmm. Are there any marks, markers, pencils? Is there any gum underneath it? They'll make sure that there's nothing on there that's an unknown substance to them or that something that could be sticky or bother them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then they'll check the table before they put their arms on it. In many cases, just being sure that it's a smooth surface and that there's nothing on it. Okay. If you hand them a piece of, of paper with a picture to color, they might ask you questions. They might look at the crayons that you've handed them, which many times they're community crayons, and say, hey, Katie, this, this crayon right here, this looks kind of new to me. Does it look new to you? Do you think it's been used by a lot of people before? 
Or do you think anyone that's ever been sick has used this crayon? And they're going to be very worried about their crayons and the use, the hygiene, and just illness in general. And even if there's a little mark on the side of the paper of the crayon, mm -hmm. very concerned about that as well. This child is going to be distracted in many ways while you're speaking. If you say something and the child doesn't think it sounds the way they, they think it should, if you're telling a story about, maybe you're telling a story about Jesus and you happen to say, oh, in Christ Jesus did this, this child might raise their hand and say, Miss Katie, it's Jesus Christ, not Christ Jesus, and correct you. And you might mm -hmm. be like, oh, yeah, well, they're both the same thing. And then the child's hand might come up again. Well, really, they're not the same thing, Miss Katie. I think they're different. This is a child who, in their mind, their mind might get stuck on various things. Certain things have to sound a certain way, feel a certain way, and look a certain way. So your child with OCD in the Sunday school classroom might appear very distracted. It can be immobilizing for a child, can't it? It can be in some cases. So as the child is getting ready to come to church, are all of these kinds of thoughts and fears formulating even before they get in the minivan to head to church? Well, they're probably not thinking about the classroom just yet because mm -hmm. there are so many parts of getting ready that they must they must succeed with. Many of them will start out opening their drawer to get clothes out, mm -hmm. and if they pull the clothes out of the drawer, they may not have felt right or they might have had a bad thought in their mind, something okay. that made them uncomfortable, so they'll put them back and they'll do it again. They might have to do it three or four times to finally get the clothes out of the drawer. Okay. Then if they go to get dressed, after the clothes are partially on them, they might become uncomfortable. Maybe the waistband is too tight. Maybe they don't like the feel of the clothes that day. Maybe they were cold when they put them on. They don't like them. Maybe their hair's in the back of the shirt, and, and now the shirt is a bad shirt because it felt bad when they put it on. They might go through numerous outfits in the morning. They definitely, when they're getting ready, other people are impacted. So we have to consider, too, mom and dad are going to be a little bit tired when they get to church because it's a very hard process for the whole family this getting ready process. Even hair in the morning with a lot of the girls I work with with OCD, most of them, mm -hmm. do not like the feeling of the brush up against their hair. They feel like even if mom's just brushing the ends of it, they feel like it's being pulled and it hurts them. Therefore, you might have a child even come to church with a, I call it the once over. It's where the parent does what they have to to make the child look okay to walk out the door. Mm -hmm. They just brush their hair one time and say, that's it, and let mm -hmm. it go without it looking mm -hmm. really nice. That's what the morning looks like with a child with OCD at home. You know, some parents tell us that it's really hard to come to church because their child who has a hidden disability, like OCD, isn't arriving at church looking very put together they might have changed outfits several times and, and maybe the hair isn't quite brushed or the teeth haven't been brushed. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for volunteers to really understand all that goes on yes. before the child hits the door. Definitely. And even to realize what the parent is experiencing at the door, mm -hmm. we're not going to have a happy mom or dad. Whoever's doing the drop-off has been through a lot, and, and we're very fortunate that they made it this far and got mm -hmm. to church. Mm -hmm. Truly, it's been a rough morning, and we should be thankful that they got there. I have had parents tell me that have children with OCD, that they'll start to get ready in the morning for church. Mm -hmm. And if they reach a point that they feel as a parent that they're sinning more, sinning because of the way they're, they're frustrated and reacting, they'll think, you know what, I can't possibly get enough out of church to make it worth going today Aww. with the way I'm acting. And the parents will feel bad about themselves and the way, the way that they are. Because if you have two hours to get everyone ready mm -hmm. and some of these things start to happen where a child doesn't want their toothbrush, toothbrush and they don't want um, the mint toothpaste and then they don't want the strawberry and then they don't want the watermelon, mm -hmm. then there's no toothpaste that will work for them. And then, you know, they don't like the way it feels. It's not soft enough. The, the brush bristles feel harder than they were yesterday. It's frustrating for parents, so we should love on the parents when they get there too and just tell them we're really glad to see you and... You know, uh, Sunday mornings can be a challenge sometimes to get ready in the morning, but we're so glad that you're here, and we are so glad to see her again. Thanks for great. bringing her. That's great. The child with OCD 
may struggle a little bit with devotional time or prayer life. Can Mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that and help volunteers and pastors to understand what that might look like? Yes. There are kind of two ways the devotional life may go with OCD, depending on the severity of it, Mm -hmm. depending on what percentage of it is scrupulosity versus other content areas for the primary fear. But one of the ways is just pretty typical devotions where they they may not get the same thing out of it, but they try to do it Mm -hmm. on a regular basis like other kids their age. The other one, which is um, definitely, you know, I like to work with these kids in therapy because it's something I want to see improve for them. It's so hard when they can't have a rich relationship with God. And what many of them will report is that their prayer time at nighttime, they will go to walk up the stairs and get ready to go get their Bible and go to bed. And all of a sudden they start to walk up the steps and they get a thought about Satan. So they have to turn around and walk back to the bottom of the steps do it again, try again, because certainly in their mind, a prayer couldn't possibly get to heaven and be blessed if there was a thought of Satan while they walked up the stairs. So then they might try to go at it again, and then maybe they had the word demon come in their mind. So then they have to go back to the bottom of the steps and start up again. Many of them, this ascension up the stairs at night, if they have a second floor bedroom, starts this whole process, Mm. which is not fulfilling for them because they never feel connected to the Lord and their devotions. They just feel like they're struggling. When the child finally gets up, they may decide that they're going to read a couple verses. For a child with OCD, reading a verse might mean reading a verse up to 10 times or even more than that. Mm -hmm. And each time, they don't know what the verse said. Mm -hmm. They're just hoping to have that co-thought in their mind be a good one. You know, let it not be Satan, demon, or any bad words. Let it instead be something that goes along with good in the Bible. So they finally maybe get that 10th time that there were no bad thoughts while they read that verse. So they can kind of check it off that they did Mm -hmm. it. And then they might start their prayer. And their prayer has to have certain parts to it. Almost every child with OCD has a certain number of lines in their prayer. It may start out, Dear Lord, please forgive me for my sins. I've sinned today and I'm so sorry. But if while they're saying that something bad happens, they have to say that again because in their mind it doesn't count. By the time they get to the, you know, blessing their family, blessing their sleep, praying for someone who's ill, by the time they're finished with that, this is a child who is exhausted. Of course, it's bedtime and they're tired, but Mm -hmm. they are exhausted. Their heart is exhausted because they mean all this and they want it to go to God so well, but this OCD is trapping them and making it so that they feel like they can't finish this process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also at the end of the prayer, a lot of kids get stuck with the in Jesus name and some of them will have rituals that they have to complete with that, where they have to say in Jesus name with the Holy Spirit giving utterances as needed, amen, and get it just right. Mm -hmm. And then when they're done, you know, saying that however many times it is. And for many of them, those are very sacred words. And so that might be the hardest part to get through. So when we speak of how the devotions go with children with OCD, it's hard work. Mm. It doesn't mean they love Jesus any less. It just means it's hard work. So what do we do to nurture and comfort children and console them when they're struggling like this? Well, some of the best things to do with children who are struggling that have OCD are to make sure we have concrete things to look at in books. Because let's say, for example, um, many of the Christian bookstores have How Do You Accept Jesus as Your Savior books. It's a concrete book. Mm -hmm. You can go through it. You can see the picture. You can say, you know, little Seth, have you been in this place before? And he shakes his Mm -hmm. head. Yes, I did that before. Something very concrete is how we help children. OCD by nature is two questions that go on your mind. Did I really do that or do I just think that I did that but I really didn't? So many times for children they question whether they're going to go to heaven. Did I really accept Jesus Christ as my Savior? Or do I just think I did it one time or a hundred different times and maybe it wasn't the real one that counted? So our job as caretakers and, and leading these flocks of children, including those ones with OCD, It's our responsibility to find ways to make that experience of receiving Jesus concrete for this child, whether it's by a book or something so simple. If you have a child who accepts Christ and they're in the little primary group, cut a little heart out, put Jesus' name in there, teacher signs her name, folds it up, gives it to the child. 
the so child that's a will tangible have reminder. That. The child will have that when they turn 21. If you give them something that's concrete that mm -hmm. helps their mind with OCD, know the difference between did I really do that or do I just think I did that? Well, I must have really done that because Miss Katie signed her name to it and here's the little paper in my jewelry box. So tangible proof tangible. is very comforting. Absolutely. Okay, great. So what can become a problem at church or during church activity time for a child with OCD? Well, um, basically things that can become a problem are anything that is distracting on another person, anything mm -hmm. that's distracting in the room. And what a child, like if a child came in and if there was a piece of gum on his chair mm -hmm. or a little bit of glue on the table and his finger got in it, mm -hmm. what do you do in order to help that? Or even, um, this is one of the more sad areas to treat with OCD, but children will become upset about something about another child's physical mm -hmm. features that's very distracting to them. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we simply want to comfort everyone's feelings and just kind of leave the child to stay by us and not think about those things with that other child, whatever it is. It might be a shirt they have on. It might be the way their hair's done. Some kids have to have smooth hair, and maybe they, they expect everyone else in the room to have smooth have hair, smooth too. Hair. And mm -hmm. if someone has hair that's a little bit too teased, it might up totally upset that child. In that case, we just kind of separate them from it, put them in a seat so they're not really even looking past mm -hmm. that child to see the teacher. If you find that glue on the table, the best thing to do is to go over to that child and say, this looks like it's just glue. And you can even put your finger in it and say, it does, it smells like glue, it is glue, and it's not gonna hurt my finger. I'm gonna wipe it off. I'm gonna wipe the table off. I'm gonna change the place you're sitting, the table that you're at, mm -hmm. and it's totally okay. There's nothing to worry about firm, confidently walk away. So very decisive. Yes. yes. And if there were a piece of gum on the seat, the same thing. Go over, get a tissue, take it off. That is gum. Be very clear because they're going to go through the what ifs. What if it's this? What if it's that? That is gum. For sure, that is gum. I'm going to put that in the trash can and I'm going to give you a different chair to sit in. I'm going to take your chair, but I'm going to be totally fine with that chair. So you want to correct things that are distracting or upsetting to them. And just, you know, if it involves mm -hmm. another person's feelings, certainly just don't talk about it except to that child and redirect. But if it's something else, you know, just trade chairs, mm -hmm. trade table, whatever you have to do. I've worked in the past with teachers who have not really understood the issue of anxiety and have said, well, I don't see this OCD at all. That kid just wants to keep going to his locker all the time, and he's just wasting time out there, and, and I don't see it. How do you help people to understand that this is a real diagnosis? Well, there are different settings. There, there, there's therapeutic, there's spiritual, and there's educational. And although we want everyone in every area of a child's life to be informed about it, it's more important that we just handle whatever the specialty issue is in that area the best we can in that area. So at school, it's teaching them and providing whatever reasonable accommodations, teaching, talking, mm -hmm. training, anything mm -hmm. we can do to help with the classroom and the teacher or whatever she wants to know or whatever she wishes for us to do for that child. Spiritually, definitely, we want them to learn about the Lord. We'll accommodate them. We'll do whatever we can to keep them comfortable mm -hmm. when they're at church. That's just what we do in that arena. Therapeutically, that's where it's our job to talk about diagnosis of what is going on. What's the primary diagnosis? What other ones could be mm -hmm. possibly there? Which ones do we need to keep our eye out for? What's the best method of treatment? Mm -hmm. Is it moderate, mild, severe mm -hmm. medication? You know, Should we refer to a psychiatrist for the medication? What do we do? That's mm -hmm. where we deal with that. So most of the time when I talk with other people, um, whether it's education or in spiritual settings, I try not to really bring the DSM or any of that into it. I almost don't want to go there. Like mm -hmm. I almost want to just stick with education or spiritual, okay. whatever the need is. Okay. So what are some final pointers now that we have information about these, these different subtypes of anxiety? What are some pointers that you can give us to help all children who have anxiety disorders as they grow in Christ? What a great question, Katie. Boy, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with just daily parts of life, mm. managing them in a little bit different way because your child has OCD. And OCD, anxiety, social phobia, any of them. I think that some of the best ways we can help our children are sleep. A lot of times we look past sleep. 
And I encourage parents who have a child that has anxiety, usually sleep is most important two nights before an event. Hmm, interesting. Not the night before, but two nights before. We want the night before to be decent sleep, mm -hmm. but two nights before we want to be excellent sleep. So many times there are problems on Sunday morning with church because many times we look and say, well, let's go to the football game. We had a hard week of school this week. You know, let's go do something. Let's stay out late. We don't have to get up tomorrow morning, but we pay for it on Sunday mm. from Friday night. Any child that has anxiety, I would encourage the parent to make sure that the night before the night before okay. they go to church on Friday night, then they should have a good night of sleep. Okay. Another thing to do is feed protein for breakfast on Sunday morning. If we give kids a bunch of white flour carbs or box cereals, they might have a harder time because even though they don't have a sugar issue or they're not diabetic, still their blood sugar is impacted a little bit. Mm -hmm. And in kids that have anxiety, it does impact their anxiety a little bit. So we encourage protein. If you can get a child to eat eggs, do it. Whatever you can find on Sunday morning that has some protein in it, even if it's nuts, just feed it to them. Okay. And that will help them a great deal. So I find sometimes just looking at, you know, sleep, eating, um, exercise patterns, maybe make sure the child has some exercise on Friday or, or Saturday mm -hmm. so they have a chance of being more relaxed on Sunday. Any of the anxiety disorders that would benefit. So if we implement all of those strategies and still we have a child that's displaying severe symptom, symptoms of anxiety, what do we do then? If it's understood when the child is dropped off by their parent that, that this will probably happen. Mm -hmm. If they stop and say, my child has PTSD, I know there's a little bit of an issue that's going to happen here. My child has OCD. I know this is what's probably going to happen here. Is it okay unless it gets really hard for you if I just let him stay here during this time? Mm -hmm. If they say that to you, mm -hmm. then then a step that you can take, I call it three, two, one, and three senses. It's something you can use with anyone that's having anxiety for any reason. Mm -hmm. What it is, it's teaching you to be present instead of future oriented. Anxiety is based on what if, what if, what if the future. Mm -hmm. The way we can conquer all anxieties is to tune ourselves into the present. And I make a game out of it with kids. And what I'll say to them is, we're going to do something. 333 the first thing we're going to do is, and I'll just do this with you mm -hmm. for demonstration okay. purposes. So let's say you're a little bit anxious in the classroom. Katie, okay. I need you to play a game with me. Okay. I need you to look around the room and tell me three things you see. Um, I see a guitar. I see a piano. I see a picture. Okay, wonderful. Now I want you to listen really carefully and tell me what three things you can actually hear in this classroom. Mm, I hear... Um, someone jingling their keys and I hear the air conditioner. Okay, one more thing. And I hear um, I, I hear the um, taping machine. Okay, great. The third, I need you to come up with three things that are different textures or surfaces that you can actually feel and tell me what it feels okay, like. Okay, well I feel this smooth paper and um, then I feel this rough chair. This is a little bit rough and then um, I feel my ring and it's bumpy. Okay. <laughs> nice and bumpy that way. <laughs> okay. So great. So you've been able to do three, three, and three. And if you appear relaxed at that point mm -hmm. and you're the child, I might stop at that point. Okay. If you don't, I'm going to mm -hmm. go to two, two, and two. So I'll say, okay, great job, Katie. You did the threes. Now we're doing the twos. Okay. I want you to go back and pick two things out that you didn't already tell me that you see in this room. Okay. I see my friend Rhonda. And I see a plant behind okay, me. Great. Good job. Mm -hmm. And tell me two more things. You're going to have to listen very carefully to find two more sounds that you can I hear. Know that's hard. Um, I hear a cricket outside the door. Mm -hmm. And um, I also hear a vacuum cleaner. Okay, great. Good job. And I need you to touch two things you didn't touch before that have a different texture than the first three. Okay. I, I can touch this leaf and it's um, a little bit sticky. Mm -hmm. And then I can touch the filing cabinet here, and it's sort of smooth and cold. Okay, very good. And again, if my client at this point or my student in the classroom is calm after two, I'll say, great job, you did it, you're successful, let's let's move on. If not, I'll go one, one, one. And I've actually never had, ever had a person that was still anxious after we did one, one, and one. So this will be the final step. Katie, I need you to look around and name one thing that you didn't tell me when we did three and two. 
Um, okay. Um, I see a lamp okay. right next to me. Okay. And tell me one more thing that you didn't tell me before that you could hear. Um, I hear a door closing in the hallway. Okay, I just heard that too. And third, third thing I need you to do, and the very last thing, name one thing that you can touch that has a certain texture that you haven't felt yet. Um, I, I feel um, this. Um, clipboard. Okay. And, and how does that feel? It's kind of smooth. Okay. Good. Yes. Good. And that exercise, Katie, will work for any age as long as they're able to mm -hmm. communicate with you mm -hmm. and, and understand words and they're wonderful so with it. So you could break that cycle. It sure does. You cannot be anxious. How do you feel mm -hmm. now? I feel great. <laughs> Good. Yes. But yeah, you can't feel anxiety because it's future tense whenever you've done so much in the present. So it is a okay. quick little technique to use. Interesting. I, I really like that. I think I might try that in my classroom as well. Um, one final thing. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about children. We've talked a little bit about teens. And um, I'm wondering, what about the nursery? Oh. We have babies <laughs> that have anxiety too. Right. So that's true. What